Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, episode 167. Yeah, and actually, it, it, a lot of changes, and, and that's one of the things that's very, very important, I think, for people to understand, is that whatever spot you're in today with your life, it's not going to stay there as far as networking is concerned. I mean, I was at Cabletron when we had to deal with Ethernet, tokering, FDDI, frame relay, ATM, ISDN, X.500, and we had all these different protocols. Now it's pretty much Ethernet and Wi-Fi, so it's a little bit easier, but it's going to change. <laughs> Wireless Land Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless lands. This Wireless Land Professionals podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless land veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Well, Perry, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm really, really good, Matthew, and thank you very much for inviting me in. Pleasure for sure. So for those who don't know you, introduce yourself and uh, what you are doing these days. Okay. Uh, my name is Perry Carell. I'm a director of product management at, um, at Arrowhive. I've uh, been in networking since uh, longer than I almost care to say. <laughs> goes back uh, to the Cabletron days, and I remember teaching SEs how to core ThickNet cable. So uh, wow. it's a it's a long history in in uh, networking, and uh, my history in uh, in RF goes back even further. I spent uh, ten years in the Air Force working airbind radar systems. So that's kind of where I. Uh, picked up the RF side of my house and uh, networking was Cabletron to today. So a lot of different jobs. So you've seen changes through the industry. Yeah, and actually <laughs> it, it, a lot of changes. And, and that's one of the things that's very, very important, I think, for people to understand is that whatever spot you're in today with your life, it's not going to stay there as far as networking is concerned. Great, I, mean, yeah. I was at Cabletron when we had to deal with Ethernet, tokering, FDDI, frame relay, ATM, ISDN, X.500. And we had all these different protocols. Now it's pretty much Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So it's a little bit easier, but it's going to change. That's the constant, right? Change. A absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, one of my roles at, uh, at Aerohive is I'm actually the interface to the IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance. Okay. So, you know, we all talk about the latest technologies coming out, but these guys, especially the IEEE, they're talking about stuff that's, you know, just getting to the drawing board, which means we're going to be seeing products three, four, five years from now. And this stuff that's, it, it's, it's brainiac stuff that's never going to, I, I shouldn't actually say that, but it's probably never actually going to become a product, but there's going to be a lot of technology that leads out of that. I mean, a lot of the neat stuff that comes out, um, I'll give you an example right now. They're, um, they're actually talking about full duplex Wi-Fi. They've been talking about full duplex Wi-Fi for many years, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, trying to see what it's going to be, whether that actually happens or not, whether it's because it's cost effect, it's not cost effective, or whatever, there will be some great technologies that kind of filter out from there. And that's the important thing to look at is that, you know, that it's not just, even when a standard come out or a certification come out, it's not like I have to support all that, but there might be some nuggets yeah. and stuff buried in that that you definitely uh, will show up one of these days. It's all part of the process, isn't it? You discover, you try things, you learn. Exactly. And, and sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> Or it doesn't effectively work in a production network. Exactly. Yeah, there's commercial uh, application and there's theoretical and somewhere in the mix of all that, we get what we have today at the current. Exactly. And one of the important things people realize is the best technology never wins. And, and whether that's, you know, uh, a 747 or, um, you know, a supersonic uh, Concord um, or whether it's Ethernet versus token ring or whether it's, you know, whatever, it's, it's got to be cost effective. It, it's got to be something that's that's easy to deploy and use, not just the best technology. How did you transition into Wi-Fi? Why Wi-Fi? I got tired of thick net cables. No, I, I, as, <laughs> as, as networking evolved, as I said, I started with thick net cables and went through that that whole um repeated shared environment into the switched environment. And then I, I moved to different companies as we went along. So I've worked with the, the Aeronet product. I've worked with the Aruba product. I've worked with the Xeris product. Now, obviously, I work with the with the Aerohive product, um, which, which is actually really, really important that you, you I went through the, the wired evolution. And I've also went through the, the wireless evolution in a way, which, which I think is was made me was very lucky for me because a lot of people get into a certain 
um, environment, whether they're working for a vendor, working for a supplier, working for a company, and they know one technology for three, four, five, six, seven, or eight years. And I've actually worked with different technology, not just different technology, but different architectures. You know, in Wi-Fi, you think you have the controller and the controller list. I've worked for environments that had both. So I, I didn't get this ideology of that, you know, you can only work, it only works this way or it only works that way. It's like, you know, they both work, they do different things. And it, it actually, I think it gave me an advantage over a lot of other people that have been locked into the same architecture for uh, for 10 years or so. That kind of leads into the other question I was going to ask you is, what's something you think you got right on early in your, as you started your career? Well, what I got right, and I think, and I, I strongly recommend it to other people, is in order to be successful as a technician, as an engineer or whatever in, in Wi-Fi, you really need to understand layer one, layer two type functionalities of how Wi-Fi really works. And obviously there's a there's certifications out there and there's a lot of books out there that, that teach you that. But it's very also important to realize that it's not just, you're, you're gonna be successful, and I mean professionally successful, by not just knowing how Wi-Fi works, but also by the use cases and what I can use it for, what I can use it for in education, mm -hmm. what I can use it for in healthcare, what I can use it for in hospitality. So, so understand that level. And for, you know, another way to see it, you, for your professional success, and once again, everybody has a different idea what that's going to be, give yourself the knowledge and the skill set to be able to have discussions at a C level. I mean, it's nice to go in and be able to discuss, you know, what PDPs work, you know, and how CSMAC and all that stuff works. But it's also important to be able to go and explain, you know, how Wi-Fi and IoT and all this is going to work. A few years ago, we were all talking about the monetization of Wi-Fi, which there's a lot of hype associated with that, but there's also some very, very mm -hmm. valuable nuggets. And understanding that allows you to go in and talk to the chief marketing officer about the value of a Wi-Fi solution and not just talk to... Um, you know, the IT department. And that's where you become yeah, very, very successful years. and you make yourself more valuable, not just financially, but act as a, as a, a, a consultant type in that environment. And, and that's very, very important, at least in my mind. Very cool. If you could go back and give yourself some advice as you started out, what, what advice might you give yourself? I don't know if I'd give myself any different advice. Uh, Hands-on is really, really important. Obviously, Depending on different people learn different ways and uh, reading books and knowing all this stuff and, and getting the certifications are very, very important. But do as many site surveys as possible. I, I got lucky and I, I've probably done a million site surveys and you learn so much by doing those. And even if the people you know listening here, even if you don't have a lot of those opportunities, if you've got some type of survey tool or whatever, and you've got a friend that works at the local supermarket or whatever, go do as many as you can because it's going to make you mm -hmm. such, so much smarter. And, and one of the things that you know I've learned out of that is that when you're doing site surveys and stuff, and it's like, you know, I always say it's 40% science and 40% art and 20% black magic because when you're doing this stuff you're going to find that rf gets to areas that you're going how's that even getting here and it's going to not get to areas and yeah. the more you do and the more you do it at an earlier age you know there are people i've talked to that i've done 20 or 30 well i've probably done four or five hundred yeah. in reality and, and so that's where you know you get successful early on and so it's, it's become you and how you read it not necessarily a specific piece of equipment or whatever that's great um besides the doing is there a specific certification or class or experience you you think everyone should go through? Well, you've got the whole um, CWNA type architecture. And from the industry out there, I would say that's really the best starting place. But that's really what it is. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of information in those books. So I would definitely start there and, and make sure you understand the foundations of it. But then obviously, you, you need to go and do a lot more hands-on, a lot more capability. So once again, the, the CWNA type program is very, very important. But that's a starting point. That's not an end point in the world according to perry well i'm hearing that yeah. echoed a lot just like that you don't just arrive it's it does show your progress but it, it like you said it really is it's like coming out of college with an engineering degree yeah. you know a lot of times people come out of college with an engineering degree and you know they're not starting as a chief engineer in any company you know they're starting at the junior guy so the, they gave you the background they gave you the experience and you know a lot of time these junior engineers coming out, they, they've got a solution looking for a problem. But So you got to kind of <laughs> knock them back just a little bit and say, okay, you've got the foundation. Let's get into the real world now. And that's, that's an important thing to understand because how, how Wi-Fi works on paper and how Wi-Fi works in the real world is, is in many times very, very different. And uh, it, it's very important to, uh, you know, have a good set of peers around you that can kind of point you in the right direction yeah. or at least, you know, be your advocates and help you. 
That's great. Uh, kind of along the same lines, what does investing in yourself as a WLAN pro mean to you? Learning everything you can about, once again, not just layer one and layer two, about the industry and what's happening around it. Um, these days, we typically use the term back in the day. You know, back in the day when I was first coming up in networking, a lot of your networking um, journals were paper. You know, they weren't websites anymore. Yeah. And I would honestly get um, probably 20 different um, magazines of one type or another a week. And what I would do is as they showed up, I'd f quickly flip to them and rip out the pages of interesting articles. And I'd put them mm. aside and then come Saturday morning, I'd sit down out on my deck or porch or whatever with, you know, a lot of cups of coffee and go through the important ones. So that's, you know, once again, yeah. Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. We need to understand that. But then go through, you know, whether you have some type of favorite website that uh, automatically sends you links for the information that is of interest to you or what should be interested to you or some type of RSS feed or some type of individuals or sites you follow. That's the only way to keep up because it is constantly changing. Um, you know, we, we right now, 11AX is a big thing right now. There's other technologies already on the horizon that go beyond that. So it's a, it's important to keep track of not only that, but then like the, the security stuff, the, the Wi-Fi Alliance, WPA3 type functionality that's around there. You know, what's happening in IoT? And, and along those lines, you know, we, we live and breathe in in the Wi-Fi world. And my whole view is that IoT is going to be very, very Wi-Fi centric, not just because it's the not because it's the best technology for it, but it, because it already exists. But you're going to have Z-Wave and Zigbee and Sigfox and Thread and other low power technologies and LTEW and MQTT. So there's a lot of other things that are going to impact your life. And so, you know, to invest in yourself, it's got to actually be, you know, it says invest in yourself as a, you said, what, wireless LAN professional. Yeah. Well, almost just think of it as wireless because there's, there's a lot of other technologies yeah. that are going to tie together. Is there a mistake in the industry you see people making on a regular basis that you wish you could just stop from happening? Um, let's see. Can I get myself in a lot of trouble here by saying an answer? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to think no, about that. One of, one of the moment. challenges, and I, I mean this honestly, and I mean this with all due respect, <laughs> is there's, there's a lot of well-known individuals in the IT environment, in, in different organizations that, you know, write a lot of blogs and write all this stuff. And they're very, very smart individuals. But what I strongly recommend is avoid seeing these individuals as the great learned knowledge, because everybody's wrong at some time. And, and so, you know, <laughs> learn from these people, take it, but then actually kind of take a step back, because as you'll see over time, that just because one person says this is the way the world should be doesn't necessarily mean that's the way, the way the world would be. If you if you go back over the last few years or so and you you see the discussions about let's just use Wi-Fi in general is like 2.4 versus mm -hmm. five gig. 2.4 is evil. Five gig is good. They're they're both technologies that need to be leveraged. Uh, then we had the whole controller versus controllerless environment, and that became a religious discussion. You know, both technologies tend to have their value and me being able to have worked in both environments, it, it gives. Um, Multi-state radios built into access points where it can both radios can operate on five gig. You've got people that, you know, five years ago, it's the stupidest thing in the world will never work. Some of those same people today are saying, well, you know, if you do it right, it'll work. So it's just, yeah. you know, don't necessarily think that, you know, some of these guys are Gandhi. So it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> I already know who's going to text me when this is out, goes out. So, Well, uh, speaking of not being perfect, is there a mistake you made along your journey that you really learned something valuable? I, I, make, a lot, I make a lot of mistakes or you learning opportunities, which is the best way to do that. And a couple ones that I'm thinking of is that be aware that there are a lot of smart people out there, and which is kind of opposite. And it's not opposite of what I just said, but, you know, sometimes you'll go into uh, an organization and you're there to do a site survey or you're there to do something, do an analysis. And you're looking at the network. And sometimes when when, when you're ignorant and that's myself and ignorant, I, I mean, ignorant, not as a negative, but just somebody who just doesn't know what they're doing. You'll go in there and think of yourself, you know, what idiot set up this network? But the more you learn the more you understand what's going on, you say, that's necessarily a bad idea. It's kind of give you a quick example. Uh, you go into this environment. This is this is real life. You go in there and, and the guy's running um, four 
um, separate um, channels in, in the 2.4 band, which in North America, everybody says 1, 6, 11, blah, blah, blah. And if you ever go into a business and somebody's running, you know, four channels in that area, you know, 95% of the time, four or more channels, 95% of the time you think the guy doesn't really know what he's doing. But the 5% of the time is the guy really does know what he's doing and he's doing it right. And that's one of the important things to understand is that make sure you have all the information before you start making judgments on that. And the second thing is, is take your time and, and do it right. Uh, I'm give you another example. We were doing um, site survey at a, uh, at a college, a university, and they had these 10 dorms and these 10 dorms looked exactly the same. And when I was doing this, the company I worked for, after we did a survey, we'd say, okay, it's going to take X amount of APs and it's a guarantee. So if we were wrong, we had to come in and add all the new ones. So it's important to do things the right way. So we went in and these 10 dorms, exactly the same floor plans, everything. And so we said, you know, let's be um, cautious here. So I think we did two or three dorms. We do a site survey of them and they both came out or the two or three of them all came out and said, okay, it's going to take four or five APs, whatever it was to cover this dorm. Finally, when the deal, we actually did the install and there was one dorm. It ended up taking 17 APs to cover that one dorm. And it's because even though it looked exactly the same, this one dorm was all built with concrete and rebar. I don't know if it was designed for the end of times or whatever. Every other dorm was just sheetrock and timber. And so, you know, you're typically going to say, you know, do every building. Do, you, most people aren't going to do that, but that was one time that really burnt. Yeah. So if you're going to have similar buildings, at least go and take a reference sample at a couple of them. <laughs> and once again, the more you do this, the better you're going to get. You don't have to redo the whole thing, but at least go check in just a couple of areas and that's great. Yeah, that that would be an unfortunate. Yeah, your boss looks at you and sure. say, "What what were you doing? How how can you be off by a factor of four? You know, is there a project you've been invil- involved with that you're super proud of? Um, actually, a couple of them. Uh, one, it just as my life. You know, one of the things I did um, in the Air Force is. Uh, I was involved with the, uh, the stealth program, the stealth fighter program, while it was still a secret. So that was kind of me personally. I'm very, very proud to be involved in that program. But as far as the, 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 the Wi-Fi side, um, one of the things I'm actually pretty excited about right now is, is the, uh, the 11AX. Uh, obviously, it's a new technology. I'm kind of a little bit of an evangelist for the, uh, for the company right now. We're going around doing a lot of um, road shows and stuff. And I, I think it's really important because... As I said, I've been in the switching world for a long, or in the uh, wired world for a long time. And when we flipped from the typical repeated environment to a switched environment in a wired environment, it, it just changed everything. I mean, the way wired took off was just exponential. And I see the same thing happening with 11AX. And I'm not saying it's switched Wi-Fi. It's not. You know, it's not full duplex, anything like that. But it's important to understand and appreciate that 11AX is totally different than any of the other technologies came before, A, B, G. You know, when N came along, it was it was a big transition. We're, we're, we, we, we went into the whole MIMO type thing. We went away from uh, multipath being a bad thing to multipath being a good thing or potentially a good thing. 11AX is the same thing. And that's that's one of the things I'm, I'm pretty proud of is that making people understand what 11AX is all about. Every other protocol is like, I'm going to make it faster and I'm going to give you higher data rates. And that's really what it was all about. And 11AX is, is, a, is a transition from that. It's actually being more efficient. Yeah, it goes a little bit faster and you can, you can make those arguments, but it is actually changing the way Wi-Fi is going to work. Totally you know, going off on a tangent. And it's a very, very important to understand that. And that along with the shift from, um, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my AP level focus. And the other is what's maybe probably even more important overall is that better management of the network. Um, because if you talk to the average user, nobody wants to manage their Wi-Fi anymore. They want to install it. They want to configure it and give me a weekly report. Now, we keep saying Wi-Fi is utility. It's just like your lights. It's just like your water. Well, I don't go and tweak on those designs every other day uh, like a lot of people do with their Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi has got to get smarter. And whether you call it machine learning or AI or IoT, pick whatever acronym you want, the whole idea is technology is available today to be able to monitor what the clients are doing and then make intelligent decisions about it. You know, if I've got an AP, if I got a client connected to an AP and it's having poor performance, be smart enough to say, okay, what about the other clients on that AP? What about the clients around that AP? Are they having similar performance issues? If so, it could be the AP, it could be the RF environment. Or what about 
that client's having a problem. And in my 10,000 clients on my network, I've got eight or nine having a similar problem. And if I can identify automatically that, you know, they're all this certain type of phone with this certain type of OS, that gives me a lot more knowledge. And that's important. It's, it's making intelligent decisions like that and correlating data. And that's actually part of the whole IoT thing, the intelligence side. But I think that's the most important thing coming down. I mean, obviously, 11AX is different, but you get to the point, you know, you got people arguing about, you know, spatial streams and QAM and all that stuff. And, and that's interesting. I mean, it's kind of nerdy type talk and it's kind of fun. But if you're going to go and talk to the C-level people, that's not what they want to talk about. They want to talk about this higher level type stuff. And what's it going to do to improve my business? What's it going to do to my bottom line? And that, I think, is more important. And it comes back to what I said at the very beginning. you got to have that foundation of layer one, layer two type Wi-Fi. Yeah. But you've got to have that stuff above it and, and the value of it. You mentioned earlier, obviously, these things take years. What's the landscape you think looking like over is this? three years out, two years out, till we're going to see some of these more significant. Well, a lot things. of this, there's some neat stuff uh, being developed with um, within the, the Wi-Fi Alliance and stuff like that. But all they're really doing is putting more intelligence or encouraging vendors. And by vendors, I mean, obviously ourselves plus chip manufacturers to put more intelligence in your APs and also in your your clients. Actually, the client is an important part. And by sharing more data, I can make better decisions. But reality is, it's going to be the individual vendors that drive this because, you know, it, it's not going to be Broadcom's going to come up with, you know, this this great chipset or Qualcomm or Quantana or any of these stuff. They're going to gather all this information and make it available. But it's like, once again, you use the artificial intelligence or, or whatever word you want is how do I intelligent look at that? And that's a tough thing to those out there, yourself or whatever, who, who deals with voice. In voice, you have something called a, an MOS, a mean optimum score that kind of rates how good the voice quality is. But it's kind of a guess. You know, it's not like hard fact numbers there. What if I could do something like that for my my Wi-Fi client experience? You know, obviously, uh, the RSSI and the data rates important, but roaming is also important. Um, the, the, what are the five, the six, the seven, the 10 different components that identify a good Wi-Fi experience? And depending on what I'm doing, what application I'm running, what kind of device I'm using, how do I weight those different components to actually give me a value, whether it's going to be red, green, or yellow, or whether it's going to be a speedometer of quality? Um, it can't just be like an idiot light on a car. Red is bad. Yeah. Green is good. It's got to be something better than that because that also allows me to see trends. And if I can do that, then I can actually prevent problems before they happen or actually react very, very quickly to them. So that's the fun stuff. And you're going to have different, a lot of different Wi-Fi vendors out there. You know, I can rattle off names, but they're competitors. We're all doing different things like that. And we've all got, you know, the way I look at it, I never put down any specific vendor or whatever in that because we all got secret sauce. Yeah. We all do something better yeah, yeah. than the other person does. And I'm trying to say my secret sauce is better than their secret sauce, but it depends on what the customer is actually looking for. And I think that's the real value. And this, once again, competition is good. You know, one vendor comes out with some neat stuff and then somebody else ups the score a little bit. And that's, what's going to make the end user, the client, um, a better experience for that. And that's why it's important for, once again, back to where we were, the the, um, the techs out there, the engineers out there to not just be aware of what's happening with the product or the vendor that you deal with a day in and day out. Look outside the box and see what other people are doing, because once again, the, you're going to give you a better view of the network doing it that way. That's great. Uh, if there's a piece of advice you could give to a WLAM pro who's kind of starting out in, in their career, wanting to succeed as a pro, what what advice would you give them? Um, it kind of goes back to what I said before. Um, Try to avoid the hype a little bit about one technology over the other or one vendor over the other or one architecture over the other. Find yourself some smart people around you. Mind you, it sounds kind of opposite of what I was saying before. Find themselves some smart people around you and leverage their knowledge. Don't necessarily follow them blindly, but there's a lot of good information out there and take advantage of it. Have, you know multiple mentors and stuff and people you can bounce ideas off that won't just come back and say, no, that's a stupid idea. Um, you know, so, so look at it that way. And I think that's the most, tell you why it's a stupid idea. Exactly. And that's the most important thing. And that, that's in many ways, having a good group of resource around you is far more important than any piece of equipment or any tool you're ever going to find, because there's a lot of good survey tools. There's a lot of good sniffer tools. There's a lot of good stuff, but what, 
you can, and I'm quite sure there's people will argue which one is better than the other, but they're all going to give you a certain amount of information and how well you understand that information is really going to determine how well you do with that tool. It's not just going to be the tool itself. I mean, if, if the tool solved all your problems, you, you know, we'd all be out of business and, you know, the, 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 the robots exactly. The janitorial <laughs> staff can monitor the Wi-Fi while they're at it, you know, and I, I mean that facetiously, obviously, but it's like, it, it, it Tools only give you information. You have to decide what to do. And they might suggest causes of action or what's going on, but it's up to you to make those decisions. Because once again, back to an earlier thing at Wi-Fi, RF surveys and stuff, it, it's not a hard science. There is science there, but there's also experience. And, and there's also the stuff that, God, I don't know why it's doing that. You know, And uh, so that's, <laughs> and then that's the fun part, you know, and then once again, unless the customer's looking over your shoulder, yelling at you, but that is the fun part, trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of equipment, is there a favorite piece of equipment you're using these days that you're really enjoying? Actually, not a specific one. I go through a lot of different uh, pieces of equipment, a lot of different type of analyzers. And um, once again, as as with anything else, they all got advantages. They all have bells yeah. and whistles. So I'm not going to give anybody um, that this thing is so much better than everybody else's. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Once again, they all give you a certain amount of information. And the most important tool is your brain. Yeah, yours. And so the more you know, the better you're going to be able to use that tool. Well, how can people stay in touch with you and follow what you're up to, Perry? Okay, I hate to say this, but I'm not a big social media guy. You can <laughs> find me on LinkedIn or you can stop if you're going to Prague. Hopefully everybody yeah, yeah. listening to this is going to Prague. Stop in and say hello. Obviously, you can get me at uh, pcarell at arrowhive.com anytime. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Um, but once again, LinkedIn, I'm kind of up there and... Uh, Stop by and say hello in Prague. I got a got a couple of presentations at, at that event, and uh, yep. hopefully, I'll convince all you guys how wonderful uh, 11AX is while I'm there. Very cool. Well, th thank you, Perry. We appreciate your time. Hey, thanks, Matthew. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. Absolutely. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> it's interesting stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Ten talks. So, um, I, I think some of you heard me yesterday. Uh, I work for a company with no name. And uh, primarily, uh, I'm speaking on more of a personal behalf than uh, my organization. Um, principally, what I'm talking about today is how I foresee IT changing, uh, primarily with the new standard of uh, 802.3bt, which is fundamentally the higher power over Ethernet side of things. So as we know, there are more and more devices being connected to the network. Um, traditionally, I used to say they're more Wi-Fi. Uh, I've changed my mind to say they're actually going to be more Ethernet devices being plugged in. But every single one of these devices, whether they're PCs, phones, uh, voice devices, access points, cameras, whatever, primarily are becoming far more complicated and in a number of ways. One, they need power. Uh, they also need to be allocated from a network resource point of view into certain VLANs. You need to sort of make sure you have the, the relevant IP scoping from the DHCP, sort out your option 43, 60, 150 <laughs> options if necessary. And again, all these devices need to be sort of uh, uh, provided to the network, uh, quality of service, authenticated, etc. So fundamentally what we're seeing is still a massive increase in switching infrastructure being installed. From a networking point of view, again, uh, more and more Ethernet devices are being plugged in. Um, the amount of traffic they use is obviously increasing, but fundamentally the people that actually have to manage these on an operational day-to-day -day level. All oh, right, okay. Um, <laughs> the operational demands are obviously increasing. Staffing levels in organizations are staying flat. And as we all know, um, devices are being plugged into remote sites. So again, you still need remote sources and things like that. So where we're really seeing the bigger demand for Ethernet is really the building automation. So traditionally, Ethernet cables are provided for phones and PCs, but we're already starting to see a massive increase in general sensors, LED lighting, uh, badging systems, fire alarm systems, heating ventilation, lifts, and all of these technologies from a building operations facilities management are starting to use the IT network for management and control. What's really driving this is, uh, or will drive this in my view, is 802.3bt. So as we're all probably aware, uh, the first standard was the 3AF. Uh, they provided sort of 15 watts uh, to, uh, from the, uh, the power source. Then it moved up to 3AT, 
which is pretty much where we are now. And for the vast majority of us, that's pretty much enough. So it provides most enough power for our access points and our security cameras. But there is a massive demand now for uh, higher um, uh, power requirements. So the 3BT standard, which is likely to be actually certified later on the year, will actually include uh, increase the number of classes, but ultimately, more importantly, potentially providing uh, up to 71.3 watts to the actual power device down an Ethernet cable. So there will be a, a couple of different changes. Uh, class zero will disappear. Um, we'll still use uh, PoE or PoE plus, and now we move to PoE plus plus. If you want to put it into uh, uh, strange worlds, um, LLDP is optional. Again, part of that negotiation from the device to the switch to actually get the power requirements. But uh, yeah, it's all about increasing um, power to the device at the end of the day, because we all know the limitations on mobile is pretty much the battery. So yes, we plug our laptops and phones into batteries to recharge them, but a lot of wireless devices, uh, batteries is an issue, especially if you're gonna use them for a long time. From a sort of slightly larger spec aspect, not expecting to read this in any way, shape or form, uh, PoE 2.3BT will still use category five and category six cabling. Uh, one of the advantages we have from the mere point of view is most of our ethernet cabling is shielded. So again, you don't need to replace much of the existing infrastructure uh, that it really requires. Um, again, part of the standards, um, there is sort of a setup phase, uh, which is uh, included now. So it starts off with uh, phase three from the power source to the power device or the consumer device. So it sort of powers it up. And then the power device actually requests the amount of uh, power it, uh, it can support and actually the power it actually wants. And then the power source equipment actually provides that uh, as required. Um, like I mentioned, there are a couple of rules uh, it, um, it's built into the standard. The switch will only supply the power if it's requested. So it's not going to power a device that doesn't need power, uh, which obviously makes clear sense, but uh, not, not to everyone. And uh, there is a, a conservation mode as well. So again, some devices such as cameras will request a certain amount, but when it's in sort of hibernation mode, or there's an occupational sensor, it might switch on, require an additional load. And if it has to move around as, an, as, a, as a third mode, again, additional power may be required. So the 3BT standard will actually take this into account uh, as well. There are other standards sort of semi-related to the new sort of power side of things. Um, I think the... Um, Ethernet Alliance will actually come up with new badges. Uh, so you can see sort of uh, badge one, badge four as an example. This indicates the type of class the devices actually use. So again, you can look at a, you know, an access point as an example and see really what, what type of class you actually need for the power. So there's obviously gonna be uh, interop interoperability um, and labeling in included. And there's gonna be some 802.3 general sort of power standard stuff as well. Hopefully you're not gonna burn your comms rooms down. <laughs> So some of the devices that will use the 3D, 3BT standard, we obviously know about sort of um, access points and cameras. Uh, what we're seeing, a lot of these technologies are siloed. And over time, we're actually seeing these being, becoming integrated. So yes, we're seeing security cameras. Yes, there's facial recognition systems. Yes, there's gateway entry systems. If you can start actually combining those, so you can walk up to a gate, the camera sees you, go to a facial recognition system and allow you open, Again, there's uh, efficiency performances there as well. And I'll talk about sort of heating, lighting, ventilation in a moment, but again, you can start seeing some of these tight silo technologies now uh, being incorporated into the IT infrastructure. Um, I hate this slide because there's an obvious mistake in it, but this just gives you an indication every single dot there is actually an ethernet cable. So traditionally we thought about um, uh, normal PCs and access points, but we're seeing now organizations producing digital signage, occupational sensors, uh, LED lighting, uh, general displays and things like that as well. And pretty much you can power any device via ethernet cable. So you don't have to have a separate sort of a power run to a particular location. What's the dark one? What's the oh, shade control? So again, from a, um, a ventilation point of view, cooling a building down is actually takes up a lot of power. I think you uh, should have said red. Uh, yes, that was the obvious mistake. Um, so again, obviously on the blue side, if you, if you can, um, 
Uh, if you re reduce the um, reduce the power, um, obviously reduce the light coming into a building, you need to control it uh, less. Uh, an obvious uh, example from a deployment point of view is PoE lighting. Uh, again, that seems to be a big demand at the moment, especially for greenfield sites, and even sort of retrospectively for uh, other environments as well. Again, just from a how much cabling you need to do and the different types, uh, just makes the deployment installation so much easier. It can be integrated into occupational sensors and lighting controls and all the, all the rest of it as well. So there will be a requirement to validate PoE. So yes, there are power uh, problems, uh, as mentioned yesterday, just because you've got a, yeah, you know, a 32 port switch doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna power 32 PoE devices, uh, especially now uh, moving up to higher requirements. Obviously there's an in-out uh, calculation to take into account as well. So um, understanding what the switches can deliver, understanding what the, uh, the devices actually require is gonna be uh, crucial moving forward. Um, old cable can probably still be used, but again, sometimes it might need to be uh, tested and if you use PoE repeaters, again, exchange ranges, but not necessarily you have the uh, correct link capabilities. So yeah, power budgets are primarily there. Um, there are ways of testing it. Um, and obviously there's, uh, uh, you can validate it in a variety of different ways. So there are tools that can uh, validate which class you get and also draw the power uh, from particular devices. We have a testing process that we generally recommend as well. So, you know, obviously, if the, is the cable valid? Um, are you getting uh, the necessary uh, wattage and load? Are you connected to the network in the correct way? LLDP, right port, right switch, authentication, VLAN, scoping from an IP address, can you get to the network resources, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so conclusions, uh, 20 seconds left. Uh, primarily, I foresee the IT network and uh, facilities management converging in the future. So uh, basically improved operational technology. So you can integrate, obviously, the traditional LAN data type of requirements or Wi-Fi LAN data into more of a business moving forward. So again, just to conclude, make sure you plan your deployment from a network aspect and make sure you understand your power management requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless LAN Professionals podcast. The podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless LAN Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi.